There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day, it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country. And there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. I'm Dave Schrader. That's Tim Dennis. And Tim, we've got some supernatural news to share. But before we do that, yeah, I would like to uh, a promote the fact that uh, this Thursday, this coming Thursday, is the fourth and final installment of the Travel Channel specials that I'm hosting. Oh, and it is with the Ghost Brothers. Nice. So yeah, it's uh, the Ghost Brothers house party. Uh, haunted house party i think they're calling it and i will be the host as we look back on some of their favorite moments from their series uh we'll share some laughs some scares some inside information never before seen footage and uh, just have an overall good time so i hope that uh, people will check that out that's this coming thursday on the travel channel go set your dvrs for the ghost brothers special thursday now we're still trapped at home on many people some people are starting to get back out there but Movie theaters haven't officially opened yet, Tim. No, not quite. Not quite. But there are people itching for a good spooker, Mm -hmm. a good, scary movie. And uh, right now you can find it over on Amazon.com. You should have left. That's a new movie by Blumhouse. Oh, 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 I thought you... you, Blumhouse. Blumhouse. I thought you were going to tell me I should have left to go to the theater. No, oh, no, because oh. the theater isn't even open. The only way to watch it right, right. now is by right. watching it on some of the streaming services. Now, I'm going to tell you that the ticket price is a bit hefty. It's 20 bucks for the movie, but I sat down with my entire family to watch it. So, you know, my, my daughter said, oh, my God, 20 bucks for a movie, Dad. And I said, honey, you realize if, if all five of us went to the movie theater mm-hmm. just to walk in the door and see this, would have been about 35 bucks. Then... All you little miscreants would have wanted your milk duds, your raisinets, your popcorn, your soda pops. I'd have been out $2,875 by the time this thing is done. <laughs> Very true, yeah. Nineteen ninety nine at home and then some good old Orville Redenbachers is the way to go. As a matter of fact, I'm wondering if people aren't just going to start doing this more often, staying home to watch these kind of movies, which could be detrimental to the uh, the big screen. But, you know, I really I only try to go see movies – um, unless they're passing us in for uh, free screenings, I really only go to big budget movies like the the King Kongs, Godzillas, Star Wars, Star Trek, things that you want to see on a major screen. I don't need to see rom coms or really even scary movies on a big screen. You got a point there, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I, I like to see the big big spectacles. But I did see Kevin Bacon's new foray into horror. You realize? I don't know if people know this, but Kevin Bacon's done quite a few horror movies. He has? Yeah. You know, he was in the first Friday the 13th. He was one of the teenagers that gets killed in the first Friday the 13th. Yeah, he was, Did wasn't you? he? Yeah. 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 He was also in Stir of Echoes. Okay. He was in Flatliners. Yes, he was. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I know there was a couple other. My daughter was telling me about the other day because she watched them. Um, but he's been in probably about five or six horror movies this new one is kind of a psychological thriller horror movie called you should have left uh kevin bacon um is a man with a a dark background and he is married to a pretty young actress there's a strange gap in their age tim which is just despicable they're like 15 years apart it's what? horrible i know oh Wait, that's my horrific. wife and i are that same age gap. oh i mean anyway, that's beautiful <clears throat> yeah. they share uh, they share a beautiful little daughter together mm-hmm. and uh this is in between her filming and uh, they decide they're going to take a little family trip together to just get away and enjoy a few weeks and and it's played by that actress uh with the blonde hair 
Oh, yeah. the the generic one? <laughs> yeah. No, I can't. Oh. I can never remember her name. No. She's uh, she's a very sweet girl. She's got the kind of faraway eyes and blonde hair. She was in uh, Ted 2 and uh, Million Ways to Die in the West with Seth MacFarlane. And I'm sure she's done other things, but her name escapes me right now. And I feel bad about that. Um, Ooh, uh, but she, maybe you could look it up whilst I, I, I talk about this. I will do uh, that. Anyway, you should have left. They, they go there to this house and strange things start to unfold. Um, this house is much like uh, Doctor Who's TARDIS. It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. This house holds many secrets. And throughout it, we're trying to figure out what's going on. And, and the little girl wants to know her secret about her daddy, wants to know what is going on with her father. And it turns out uh, that that he was under um, a lot of scrutiny because his wife, his first wife died in kind of a, a tragic way. And people thought he was involved in it, although he was cleared and acquitted of all uh, charges. You can see he's still haunted by this past and he's, you know, it's hard for him to go places because his name was splashed all over the news. He was a very famous doctor and, you know, no matter where he goes in the world, people seem to know who he is and cast that kind of dark glance at him all the time. So, you know, it's, it's a tough life to live under that specter of, of a murder that uh, you didn't commit. And in this house, his mind starts to unravel. And it is a really weird, twisted tale. It's not your standard ghosty fare, but it is really kind of shocking and psychological thriller-esque. With that said, there was still something missing for me. I can't figure out what it was, but uh, they, they end up trying to spend um, most of the movie, uh, the at least uh, a couple of them, trying to get out of the house and mm-hmm. escape the house. And... That's kind of the premise of the movie. I don't want to give much away because it, it lets in, and there's a lot of little red herrings that they throw out there, little little uh, things to take you down one path that, that aren't really there, but you don't know which ones are real, which ones are not. Uh, I would say out of five stars, I would give this a solid three and three-quarter stars. Hmm. I, I would have given it four, but like I said, there's just this something missing, and I can't tell what it is. But, um, I, you know, I enjoyed it. Kevin Bacon was great. Uh, the, the blonde actress was really good. Amanda Seyfried. Yes, that's it. Amanda Seyfried. Okay. I can never flip and remember. I can picture her face vividly, but I can't remember her, uh, her name anyway. Uh, so three and three quarter stars out of five, you should have left. Uh, I'm glad I stayed. That's all I'll say. I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed the, uh, the entertainment value. We've got some stories to share, Tim. Uh, today and I've broken them up into segments. I've got some normal paranormal uh, stories to share. Okay. Okay. And then I've got um, the world crisis uh, stories to share. Oh, Dave, we don't want to hear about the world crisis stuff. All no, no, no. I'm just saying it's as if as if we haven't had enough already. These things are also happening. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's what we'll be talking about. And then I've got two tales from the what the f- files, Tim. Ooh, the what the f- files. Yeah, yeah, what the f- mm-hmm. files. I know that those are always uh, very popular to you. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, let's start off another, as long as we're in entertainment news, and Pluto TV has been a, a um, great uh, sponsor for our show. Mm-hmm. Pluto TV, Tim, is announcing a new channel. Ooh. And you may have thought that Pluto TV has enough channels. Well, you thought wrong. They plan to add their collection once again. These channels are Pluto TV Paranormal and Pluto TV Best Life, which who cares? We want to talk about the paranormal yeah. channel. If yeah. you enjoy stories about ghosts and in-depth stories about apparent alien sightings as well as UFO sightings, there's no doubt this is the channel you're going to absolutely love. You'll find Pluto TV Paranormal on channel 571. Oh, According nice. to this article, we can promise you will not regret tuning in to this channel if you're a fan of anything paranormal. <laughs> Pluto's turned into a hell of a TV streaming service, and the best part is it's free. Yeah. So you download it on all your streaming devices and uh, watch it that way. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're going to go to North Wales, Tim. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. I think that actually might be closer. Yeah, I think, I think you're pretty close on that deal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, eerie pictures have emerged of uh, one of North Wales' most haunted asylums, Tim. 
Ghost hunters have previously been warned to stay away from Pool Park in Ruthin over fears that the building is dangerous, Tim. I am I too dangerous. <laughs> but images taken recently have surfaced on social media showing the 200-year-old site in rack and ruin, Tim. That was our original rap names. Yeah, we rack. started back in the uh, late 70s, yeah. Rack and Ruin. Yeah, I, you were Rack and I was Ruin, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We still yeah. live up to that, too. Yeah, yeah. Paranormal investigators claim is possessed by an aggressive spirit and carries an evil energy, with some even claiming they've been attacked by spooks and specters there. The former country estate and asylum was bought by Robert Holmes back in 1992 with the plan to turn it into a care village, Tim. Aww. Aww. But the development was not pushed forward, and the company put the manor house and 29 acres up for sale in 2018. They're just looking for about 2.5 million uh, pounds, Tim. Is that That's it? A, yeah, just 2.5 million pounds. Do you have that laying around by any chance? I got 2.5 pounds, so I'm close. Uh, really, I'm I'm at uh, I'm tipping the scales at uh, 280 pounds. So we're not, we're still not even close. Oh, I yeah. was talking money wise. As far as yeah. pounds go, uh, I could I could add about 300 to that. So uh, yeah, we got about. I was. We're both willing to pay our pound of flesh. That's what we're saying. Yeah, that's you know. Well, the company suggested it could be an exciting holiday development. Oh, that's looking for the silver lining in a rundown old asylum. Potential buyers at the moment are kind of dormant, though, Tim. The grade two listed building, which is surrounded by thick woodland, has since been secured in a bid to stop trespassers. Pool Park dates back to the 16th century when it was home to the Salisbury family, Tim. It was later rebuilt for William Baggett, the second Baron Baggett in the 1820s, Tim. I think Pool Pock was actually Tupac's ancestor. Uh, Pool Pock yeah. and Baron Baggett. Yeah, that should Baron have been Baggett. our rap names. Maybe yeah. we would have jumped to uh, prominence in the early 1970s. I However, so. it's apparently yeah. lost in a bet at the races by the Baggett family. I said Baggett, Tim, just so we're clear there. I knew that. I All knew right. that. It was later sold yeah. to the District Health Authority in 1937, becoming a convalescent home. And then... It devolved into an insane asylum used as an overspill for the North Wales Hospital in Denbigh in, in before what? closing in 1989. Did in you, Denbigh. I was going to say, did you spill on yourself there? Or? Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Old pictures show it was once a magnificent property with Gothic-inspired architecture and an ornate carved oak central staircase as the centerpiece elaborate wall wood paneling unique fireplaces and a half timbered facade ensured that the manor became a luxury and an impressive country manor but the images sent to north wales live which have been viewed more than 60,000 times show it in a state of horrible disrepair over the years the site has been visited by ghost hunters and paranormal investigators who have described a variety of unexplained encounters tim one claimed that stones were being thrown and another said they developed random bruising to their face. There's also been reports of unexplainable noises and shadowy figures at the property. Developers have constantly warned people to stay away from the privately owned site, which is teetering on the brink of collapse. That, again, makes it sound like 2.5 million uh, pounds might be a little bit too much. Yeah, you want to bring that down. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying. That uh, that that is part of the sales pitch, Tim. Never, never very well uh, thought out. No, I don't think. No, never yeah. has. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking to North Wales Live, Robert Holmes said the property is secured, fully boarded up, and regularly patrolled by the popo. <laughs> Clearly, some individuals have taken it upon themselves to force entry during a UK-wide lockdown period. We repeat ourselves previous comments that the entire property is very dangerous. To enter, they say, they do show a frightening photograph from the Spirit Walker Society of what looks like a young girl wearing a white dress standing in a doorway of a room at Pool Park Asylum in Ruthenin. Hmm. We ask that if readers respect the history and value of the building, that they do not break in and trespass as they can further delay any planning and restoration. Last year, the company scotched claims of a demonic president presence not president oh Tim. Well, yeah 
Uh, the, the scotched claims of a demonic presence at the site. They added, as to the building being haunted, we can confidently quote that we have worked there for many months and none of our employees have witnessed any unexplained phenomena. Do, 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 do. do, do. Phenomena. Do, 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 do. do. Yeah. So, again, they've even made it less appealing for me to want to buy because now they're saying that none of the uh, paranormal stuff happens there, Tim. Yeah. That's no good. So it's run down and there's no ghosts. No. Well, listen, since we're out that way, Tim, mm-hmm. since we're out by whales, let's talk about a whale of a sighting. New Loch Ness Monster sighting by a walker and incredible pictures reignite Nessie debate. If this is a genuine picture, Tim, mm-hmm. this could rank... They're saying in the top three of all time, I'm saying has to be the number one photograph, as I think the other two have already been proven to be wrong and faked. Is it just like Nessie standing up out of the lock with a machine gun like Rambo? Wearing a darkness radio t-shirt. Wow. Yeah. No. Uh, An incredible series of photographs snapped by a tourist have sparked claims that he captured the Loch Ness monster on film. Steve Chalice from Southampton, decided to visit Urquhart Castle on the banks of the famous Loch whilst on holiday in Scotland with his brother last September, reports the record. In a bid to avoid a coachload of tourists who turned up while they were at the castle, Steve explained that he initially photographing the opposite shore when he saw sort of a ripple in the water. At first glance, Steve thought he simply snagged a large fish. I started taking a couple of shots, then this big fish came to the surface and went back down again, he said. This thing is huge. It only appeared in one shot, and to be honest, that was something of a fluke. I watched for as long as you can see from the last picture, but didn't see it again. He estimated that it was at least 30 feet away, and averaging about eight feet long or longer. He stated that it was only during lockdown that he has had time to go look through the photographs that he had taken from his two-week trip, stating that he had hundreds to go through, as he's a keen photographer, Tim. A keen one. Oh, a keen one. After sharing the image of what appears to be a large creature emerging from the water online, people commenting that it might be the monster, Stephen himself stated that he believes it is to be something more mundane, like uh, maybe a big fish or a seal. Personally, I know there have been some interest and other people are saying it's a monster, but I don't believe that. Well, screw you, Steve. Yeah, Steve. Screw you and your skeptical dickhead nature. (laughs) It's Nessie, damn it. I don't... Dude, I don't know what fish this would be. It's monstrous. <laughs> and and a seal? A seal in Loch Ness? I mean, I guess they've said they've been there. But this thing looks uh, an eight-foot seal. That's impressive anyway. Why can't that be the Loch Ness Monster, an eight-foot seal? Wow, you just kind of went hard at Steve. I mean, he, sorry. You know, he, he's a person, too. I mean, Is he? I don't know. I'm skeptical of it. Maybe he's nothing more than a big fish or a seal. Mm, <laughs> like it, Steve. How do you like it, Steve? Wow. Steve added he initially thought it was a catfish and only posted it so people could try and identify it. And I, uh, identify it, Tim. Right. He said, I have to say, I don't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. And frankly, I think if anything is there, then it's a logical explanation for most of the sightings. Oh, do you, Steve? Could you show me which zoological society you attended, Steve? What kind of fishery or seal club university? Oh, no, don't say Bad choice choice of words. I apologize there. Yeah. yeah. But Steve, where where exactly do you get off? No, I don't want to know that either. But where do you... Where do you come to us with the knowledge of what this is? You had to post the picture because you didn't know what it was. If you didn't know what it was, then Steve, how the hell can you say it's not the Loch Ness Monster? Right. I've been bottled up too long, Tim. I guess so. Maybe a a walk or two during the week would be good. I ain't got time for that. There's so much TV to watch. My guess would be that what I captured was a catfish or something. As seals get in from the sea. Then I expect that's what it is, and that would explain why these sightings are so few and far between. Boo, boo, boo. That's really how Steve speaks. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Author Roland Watson, who runs the Loch Ness Mystery Blog, has been in discussion with Steve since finding the pictures on Facebook. The writer and Loch Ness Monster expert is dubious about the authenticity of the photos. He said, up until now this year, we only had distant webcam blobs due to the lockdown at Loch Ness. Then this image turned up. 
if this is a genuine picture of a creature in Loch Ness, it would easily rank in the top three of all time. This guy, I like this guy. Well, Roland Watson, you have the darkness radio stamp of approval. Wait a minute. He said the camera had blobs, and that's kind of camera shaming. Oh, well, no, he's just saying that that's, it's such grainy pixelization of these photos. All they got were these kind of blobbish uh, oh. things that they couldn't really tell no, what it was. No, Dave, you know, cameras work hard to look the way they look. No, t- the camera's not a blob. The, the images in the water were blob-like. Oh, okay. If this is a genuine picture of a creature in Loch Ness, it could easily rank in the top three of all time. At this point, I'm in an ongoing conversation with Steve as to the objections and concerns I have about this being a Photoshop picture. So we will see where that takes us. That's what Roland Watson has to say to him. Mm. Actual audio. Wow. He was going to pop on the show for us just to share that bit of information. <laughs> How stereotypical. All right, Tim, here's some more exciting news. Are you a fan of Stephen King and his writing? Absolutely. I am, too. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, folks. Uh, if you have some old hardback Stephen King novels around, my son, who's in the military now, uh, Nathan, uh, asked me, he said, Dad, if you could dig up some old Stephen King hardback novels with the old uh, dust covers, I want to start collecting those because they remind me of Grandma, and I love reading Stephen King. And I said, buddy, I'm going to do my best. So I'll tell you what, folks, I don't have any Stephen King books anymore. Um, And unfortunately, after my mom passed away, my dad had donated many of those things. If you happen to have old hardback copies of any of the Stephen King novels with the dust covers and you want to get rid of them, you can mail them to me at P.O. Box 22321. That's in Egan, Minnesota, E-A-G-A-N. Minnesota 55122. Again, that's P.O. Box 22321, Egan, Minnesota 55122. And uh, when I get a big box of them, I will ship them off to my son. The other ones I will donate to uh, Goodwill or other uh, uh, companies if we end up with doubles. But if you've got any and you want to part with them, I'd love to get them to uh, pass on to my son. I will let him know that they're coming from you. And if you want to include a nice little letter for my son, who's serving us in the army now, has stepped up, then uh, let's do that as well. I, you know, I before I read this next story, though, Tim, I, I guess mm-hmm. I should mention there there has been some big news in the in the darkness, Dave household. Sure. And I'm kind of uh, remiss for not having brought this up at the beginning of the show. Okay. I just want to take a moment to congratulate my son Linus Schrader. Mm-hmm who is uh, July 1st, takes off for his uh, his basic training and um, further training. He won't be back. I mean, he'll be back around Christmas time for a week or two, but he's basically gone now until March or April. He's part of the National Guard, uh, going into basic training and then further training for his uh, desired choice in the National Guard. Um, but he just got married last weekend. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, believe it or not, my boy is married. Uh, they're expecting their first child. So intern mini-me, Tim, how old are you feeling now? Intern mini-me is now uh, a married man expecting his first child and is part of the military as well. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes you feel old, doesn't it? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, that's my son Linus. Congratulations to him. My son Nathan shipped off on June first uh, to start his military career. He was the one that's looking for Stephen King books with the old dust covers. Uh, Linus is off on July first, and boy, man, it's going to be strange to be at home and not have my boys around. Boy, Very awesome. strange. Yeah. But uh, congratulations on both of their uh, their moves into a bigger, broader life. But going back to Stephen King, Tim. Okay. He has stepped out of the shadows recently, admitting that he has a novel in him that he really wants to get out. Hmm. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Is it possible, Tim, that Jason Voorhees was born in Castle Rock? One dude who would surely know would be Stephen King. And uh, over last weekend, King posted a beyond exciting tweet that stated that the horror writer has been thinking of a story that would focus on Camp Blood's famous slasher, Tim. Hmm. The story which King calls the best novel idea I never wrote, 
would focus on Jason Voorhees and his existential existence that performs in a cycle of being killed continuously. The best novel idea I never wrote and probably never will is I, Jason, the first person narrative of Jason Voorhees and the hellish fate killed over and over again at Camp Crystal Lake. What a hellish existential fate tweet uh, King tweeted. The possibilities for that story are endless and beyond exciting for Stephen King fans, 13th fans alike. Getting inside Jason's head would be an entirely fresh take on anything we have seen from the series. Sadly, and most likely we'll never get to read Stephen King's take on Voorhees, though. The rights concerning the house of Friday the 13th are nightmarish to navigate and constantly end in disappointing results. But, Tim, we can still hold out hope. This is Stephen King, the king of the macabre. If anybody could make some waves and start writing new stories for Jason Voorhees. I've got to guess it's Stephen King. Yeah, without a doubt, yeah. How crazy would that be? A Jason Voorhees movie, Tim, Mm -hmm. from Stephen King, a novel series about uh, Jason Voorhees. And I like that he's looking at it from Voorhees. It's like hashtag poor Jason, right? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. His, His existential existence is just to keep, he is the Kenny the South Park Kenny of the real world. <laughs> when you oh, my put God, it, you killed Jason, you bastards. When you put it that way, yeah. 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 Well, Tim, just when you think things are settling down in the world and the crazy might be ebbing a little bit, no, no, Tim, let me say this again, no. no Tiger what? King star Jeff Lowe has stepped out of the shadows to share something chilling, Tim. You know, I don't know if you followed the whole Tiger King phenomena. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Carol Baskin had won a very large lawsuit, which has never been paid to date. So the government finally turned over the zoo property that they say that uh, uh, the Tiger King himself illegally transferred title ownership to Jeff Lowe. Mm-hmm. So Jeff Lowe said, well, good luck with that. Turns out this is on an old Indian burial ground. So Carol Baskin is getting more than she bargained for now that she's won control of Joe Exotic's old zoo. Jeff Lowe says it's got at least one skeleton in the closet. I mean, like for real. Jeff and his wife Lauren told uh, TMZ Carol's court victory is a little hollow for her because she won't inherit any of the exotic animals that you saw in the Tiger King series. They're all going to Jeff's new zoo. She's essentially getting a giant dirt lot with some bamboo shoots in Wynwood, Oklahoma. Jeff says the only bonus for Baskin is the remains of a young Native American boy buried on the property. As if Carol hadn't heard enough buzz about buried bodies, Tim. As TMZ reported, Carol won a $1 million judgment against Joe and his mother way back when, but Baskin never got the money. Now the judge says Joe's transfer of the zoo land to his mom and Jeff was fraudulent. So the judge granted Carol control of the land to help satisfy that outstanding $1 million. Jeff and Lauren aren't ticked about the decision at all. They told uh, TMZ why Carol actually deserves the land, in their opinion. Now, uh, back to the human remains part, Tim. Jeff hinted that there's more than one skeleton on the land that uh, used to belong to Native American tribes. So good luck with uh, getting that haunted property. That's what Jeff Lowe is telling them. Are we going to see the, you know... Paranormal princess, instead of the Tiger King, we're going to get the paranormal princess as she takes over ownership of that property, tries to rebuild it, and is uh, confronted by dark, creaturey ghosts and objects and, and angry Native American spirits, Tim? God, I don't know if I could stand Carol Baskin, paranormal investigator. Um, <laughs> I, uh, You know, what would be interesting, though, is, is if... Um, a different slant here because didn't they claim they had found all the dead tigers on the on the property yes don't you think maybe there's a few more there could be other things buried there i'm not yeah. sure i mean it's a creepy uh, everything about it is creepy yeah i think there might be more i think the whole reason carol's excited to get a hold of that property is there may be more there than just that boy that's buried there i think she's going to try and go after our, our uh, precious little Tiger King, because there's something else buried there um, that they may be able oh. to get him on charges for. What? Yeah, that's why I think she's so excited about it. What? Oh, how about this? What if she's finally going to, you know, allegedly 
if she was the killer of her original husband, what if she has the remains and she goes and buries them on that property and they uncover them? See, Tim. now you're thinking. Now you're uh-huh. thinking. Yeah. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Yeah. I don't know what I'm thinking, but I'm thinking. Yeah. See, I, I, I think there's there's multiple uses for that property that uh, mm-hmm. that uh, that uh, Mr. Tiger King isn't thinking about. Wow. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's set our set our eyes to the skies for this next story, Tim. Mm-hmm. Before the world goes off the rails, scientists say most likely number of contactable alien civilizations, Tim, mm-hmm. out of the vastness of space is uh, thirty six. Turns out that's the magic number. That's it. Yeah, they may not be little green men. They may not arrive in a vast spaceship, but according to new calculations, there could be more than 30 intelligent civilizations in our galaxy today capable of communicating with others. Experts say the work not only offers insights into the chances of life beyond Earth, but could shed light on our own future and our place in the cosmos, Tim. I think it is extremely important and exciting because for the first time, we really have an estimate for this number of active, intelligent, communicating civilizations that we potentially could contact and find out there that there is other life in the universe. Something that has been a question for thousands of years and is still unanswered, said Christopher uh, Kanselice, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Nottingham. And a co-author of the research, uh, research not research, Tim. <laughs> Throwing a little English uh, research. In 1961, the astronomer Frank Drake proposed what became known as the Drake Equation, setting out seven factors that would need to be known to come up with an estimate for the number of intelligent civilizations out there. These factors ranged from the average number of stars that form each year in the galaxy. Uh, through to the time span over which a civilization would be expected to be sending out detectable signals. But few of the factors are measurable. Drake equation estimates have ranged from zero to a few billion uh, civilizations. It is more like a tool for thinking about questions rather than something that has actually been solved. So it's, it's like the marijuana of questions. A few puffs and it just makes you question even more questions, Tim. Right, right. Allegedly. Yeah. Oh, I, I've allegedly. been told. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not from now, first-hand knowledge. Uh, the, right. Now right. the good doctor and his colleagues report in the Astrophysical Journal how they refine the equation with new data and assumptions. Ooh, Tim, they've loaded it with data and assumptions to Ooh, come up with their estimates. Right. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I could just have my uh, handyman plumber come out and give a good estimate, Tim. <laughs> He's a good eyeballer. He could look up at that sky. Twenty five hundred. Everything costs me twenty five hundred. Yeah. Everything, Tim. That's I kind just of need some new guts in my toilet. I could probably do it for twenty five hundred. That's kind of how hey, I need, operate. Yeah. I need the backyard graded for a new pool. Ah, going to be about twenty five hundred. Hey, my roof caved in. Yeah, that's twenty five thousand. That that was a jump, Tim. That yeah yeah true. Well, Basically, it, we made the assumption that intelligent life would form on other Earth-like planets like it has on Earth, so within a few billion years of life, would automatically form as a natural part of evolution, Tim. Evolution? Or evolution. Ah. Whichever one you want. I'm just trying to sound more fancy because I'm reading from a guy in Nottingham. I see, yeah. The assumption known as the Astrobiological Copernican Principle, or ACP, <laughs> is fair as everything from chemical reactions to star formations is known to occur if the conditions are just right. In a scientific way, not just a random way or just a very unique way, then you would expect at least this many civilizations within our galaxy, he said. He added that while in a speculative theory, he believes alien life would have similarities in appearance to life on Earth. We wouldn't be super shocked by seeing them, he said. Under the strictest set of assumptions... Whereas on Earth, life forms between 4.5 BN, I don't know what that means, a oh, billion, billion. Uh, and 5.5 billion years after star formation, there are likely between 4 and 211 civilizations. That's a pretty big swing, Tim. Yeah. 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 You've either got four miles to go on that tank of gas or 211. That's a big swing. That's well, a big difference. Put it in RSVP terms. Like if you had to put out portillos for that many people right right not gonna happen i don't yeah. care my portillos no no uh, hmm. this is a lot of assumptive you know science i'm starting to be less intrigued by science tim it's very assumptive <laughs> and then they're very pompous about it oh 
Let me wag my finger and sound intelligent as I tap my temple with my my pipe. Hmm. Hmm. Let me think. I believe there could be anywhere from four to two hundred and eleven. That uh, that doesn't tell us much. Well, it tells you there's between four and two hundred and eleven. Right. And I choose eight. That's my number. <laughs> you want to get in on this pool, Tim? Uh, I'll go higher. I'll go 100. Wow. Yeah, All so, right. Somewhere in the middle. Sure. Yeah. All right. Speaking of the middle, we are now in the middle of the episode. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We've got more strange supernatural news from around the world as I open up the case files of, oh, God, not now, right after this. This message brought to you by FEMA. Home fires occur most often in winter. Keep anything that can catch fire at least three feet from heating equipment. And never use an oven to heat your home. Stay in the kitchen when frying, grilling, or broiling food. Turn space heaters off when you leave the room or go to bed. Make sure all vents are clear of snow and ice to allow carbon monoxide to vent outside. Have your furnace, heating system, and chimneys serviced each year by a qualified professional. Learn more at www.usfa.fema.gov. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. All right, welcome back to the program. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are. Uh, Tim, first we had COVID. Yes. Then riots. Yes. Murder hornets, locusts. Mm -hmm. There is severe weather, volcanic and earthquake activity taking place. And just when you think the world couldn't get any weirder, Tim, Mm -hmm. just when you think, oh, you know, let's just leave everything else alone. Scientists are hunting for a mirror universe and attempting to open portals into it. We want off this planet so bad right now, Tim. <laughs> We're trying to pop up an inter-universe portals. Imagine a world, if you would, Tim, where everything's exactly the same as this one, but no one knows of its existence, even though it could be staring you, Tim Dennis, right in the face. These are called mirror universes, a parallel world in a different time space. While this prospect may seem, you know, a bit far-fetched to many, Leah Broussard believes that these parallel universes are actually very real. In fact, she, along with her colleagues at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, is on the hunt for a mirror universe and plans on opening portals to them. What is she thinking? I don't know. Broussard is attempting to open a portal to a parallel universe by what she calls oscillation, Tim. Sounds like a fake word to me. Oscillation. You can't just be a scientist and create new words. Oscillation. You know what oscillation is, David? That's what happens when your fan goes back and forth. So basically she's going to blow a fan at a portal and try and open up a whole new world. You're saying oscillation is a real word, Tim? Yeah. I mean, I knew that, right? Right. Anyway, uh, she's going to try to open them up by what she calls oscillation, which would eventually lead her to mirror matter. To conduct these experiments during the upcoming summer, Broussard will send a beam of subatomic particles down a 50-foot tunnel past a powerful magnet and into an impenetrable wall. So what's the point of that, you might ask him? Well, what's the point of that? My my belly is an impenetrable wall. Does that mean she's going to shoot a beam of matter at my belly? Maybe. Hmm. Well, if, if the setup is just right, some of those particles will transform into mirror image versions of themselves, Tim, allowing them to tunnel right through the wall. If it works, this would be the first proof of said mirror universe. Does that make sense to you at all, Tim? A little bit. I'm not, didn't, don't lie. Okay, no. You and I grew up on Looney Tunes. <laughs> We're Star Trek. Actually, We're crazy if, things. if you use Marvin the Martian logic, mm-hmm. that made sense. The whole experiment will only take around a day, but analyzing the data may take many weeks afterward. Either way, it won't be long before the results are published. See, just like all bad ideas, Tim, it may only take a few moments to do it and then a lifetime to deal with it. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm not going to be specific on which ones I'm referring to. I'm just putting it out there. Oh, okay. All right. Now, assuming they actually exist, these mirror worlds would have their own laws of mirror physics and its own mirror history. While there isn't going to be an evil doppelganger of everyone on Earth, scientists might find mirror atoms and mirror rocks, maybe even mirror planets and stars. Wonder if they'll find a mirror Loch Ness monster, Tim. Could be. They may even find and form an entire world similar to this one, but completely cut off from it. So how did this come about is the question? Mm -hmm. Well, many people would be wondering how such an idea would even come around in the first place. I'm guessing sitting around uh, watching Star Trek and smoking a big hefty blunt. Tim. Yeah, well, that's yeah, yeah. that's where that idea would come from. Yep. As with many scientific discoveries, it started with nothing more than a tiny discrepancy, which the majority of people would just disregard. However, anal retentive scientists with nothing better to do than waste our money, Tim, on masturbating monkeys and opening up portals to other planets <laughs> and worlds. These researchers found that neutrons created in particle beams, similar to the one Broussard will use, last 14 minutes and 48 seconds on average. Tim, that is 14 minutes longer than I <laughs> I last on average. <laughs> uh, before decaying into protons. However, neutrons stored in a laboratory bottle seem to break down a bit faster in 14 minutes and 38 seconds. Hmm. Oh, it's not his fault. It happens to everybody. Well, it's we been all a have, long night. We were working. We all have bad days. Yeah. Yeah. That's all there is to it. Just 10 seconds. It may not sound like much, but the difference should be zero. As all neutrons are exactly the same, and they should decay at exactly the same rate no matter where they are or what they're doing. This links to the idea from about a decade ago from Anatoly Serebov of Petersburg Nuclear Physics Institute in Russia, Tim. Hmm. Serebov came up with the idea that ordinary neutrons sometimes cross over into the mirror world, transforming into mirror neutrons, where then they do the neutron dance, Tim. They do, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. God rest her soul. Hmm. But once they cross over, they would no longer be detectable. As if, Tim, they had vanished. <sighs> Broussard goes on to explain that this is why the life of the neutrons would look wrong and shorter. They would have actually been disappearing from the test equipment while the researchers were studying them, giving them the impression of decaying faster, Tim. They, they, don't, so maybe, they don't really decay. It's just cold outside. <clears throat> all right. Well, that and the fact that, Tim, maybe maybe we're not really aging. We're just slipping into the mirror universe. <gasps> hmm? Oh, good theory. What if the mirror universes were real and Broussard and her team did find them? What if they managed to open a portal? What if, Tim? Let's just leave well enough alone, folks. Do we need uh, mirror images of COVID that gets released into our planet? Think about it. If we open these portals, there might be mirror versions of, of murder hornets, Tim. Mm -hmm. Would those be like cuddle bees? <laughs> I don't know. What is the opposite? Uh, then, then locusts. You just came uh, up with a great cartoon idea. <laughs> <laughs> the cuddle bees. The cuddle da, 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 da. It's Dave and Tim, the cuddle bees. Hi, kids. <laughs> Welcome to a brand new edition of the cuddle bees. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about Bobby Brown being raped by a ghost. Oh, good lord. Oh, that, that's coming up later on, Tim. That's in the what, what the f files. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but first, Tim, mm -hmm. now that we've moved past that, let's talk about uh, maybe they have been doing this already, Tim. Maybe they have been opening portals. Why, you may ask? Why, I ask. Well, Tim, I'm about to tell you. Would you just calm down? Okay. Sure. Because, Tim, because... Because, 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 because they've had the Hadron Collider going off, Tim. They've got these wackadoodle scientists who you know have messed around with the laser, I've right? Been, Trying to light cigarettes with it yeah. and and have lightsaber fights without killing each other. Yep. And then they found some of these mirror universe particles, right? I've been saying but, for years, bad news. Yep. Uh -huh. yep. I think what's happened is they opened this portal during this pandemic mm -hmm. and what slips through the Loch Ness monster Tim yep. shows up again yep. well a terrified man slammed his front door shut after a dark ghost like dog figure supposedly bolted through his garden but the chilling moment was all caught live on a Facebook stream 
The man recording from his home in Bradenton, Florida, Tim. So it's a Florida man story here Uh on Darkness Radio. He narrates to the camera that he has just seen something freaky in his garden and carefully pulls open his door to take another look. That's my backyard. I'm zooming in, he says, pointing the camera outside into the darkness. He shows a long stretch of grass and a wooden fence with the scene looking completely devoid of anything paranormal. He says, this is the thing. This is the exact spot where, and then suddenly, Tim, there's a blur of movement and a dark shadowy figure streaks through the garden. Oh, beep, the man shouts, then slams the door. And of course, he didn't actually shout. Beep. He shouted the Effenheimer, Tim, the oh. big F-bomb. Oh, fudge. Right. Right. Yeah. The terrifying video was said to be recorded on the 9th of June and was shared by the paranormal YouTube channel Disclose Screen, The Grim Reefer. Mm-hmm. See, that makes me question it. <laughs> Where it sparked a debate about what this mysterious figure could be. A viewer wrote, there's something real there for sure. It doesn't even look human. Respect to this dude for knowing when it's time to shut the damn door. That was another comment. Another mused, this could be a cloaked Sasquatch. Oh, predator style Sasquatch, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Five other commenters reckoned that it was a so called cryptid known as Dogman. Meanwhile, someone else advised go to that exact spot with containers, sterile jars to cut the grass growing where the fast walker walked. Whew, that sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. It does, yeah. 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 What do you think of that? Uh, I think they could have flushed out the Dr. Seuss book a little bit more because it's kind of uh, vague instructions. That is. I'll yeah. give you that. Yeah. Top Buzz brings us our next story, Tim. Okay. Uh, listen, this is starting to gain some momentum, Tim. What kind of momentum? 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 That's momentum. Right. momentum, momentum. Tim. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, listen, uh, you're on the AI plank of the end of the world. I'm on the... Uh, um, zombie apocalypse part of the world right and and in between us lies uh, a part that we have have dabbled in and and i don't think we can uh, no longer deny tim booze fueled monkeys went crazy <sighs> killing one man and injuring 250 others tim the rise of the planet of the apes is happening i think they just slowly but surely name. yeah it could be just a, a bad pr deal Alcohol can have some strange effects on humans. If you drink too much, you get a little loopy, and if you make a habit of it, you might find yourself physically dependent on it. It's not pretty when it happens to a person, and apparently that's also true for some of our furrier relatives in the animal kingdom as well, Tim. A recent report out of India is almost too surreal to believe. A pet monkey that had been raised to drink hard liquor suddenly found itself, and this is why I won't let Tim get his own monkey. I know... He and the monkey will be playing cards together and doing shots. Yeah. And yeah, no, Tim, this can't happen. Uh, Anyway, a pet monkey that had been raised to drink hard liquor suddenly found itself without a source of alcohol and went on can only be described as a rampage. The animal injured 250 people and actually killed one man by biting him so severely, Tim. Uh Uh-huh. The monkey named Kulu. Well, that's why he was biting people. He got a bad name. He was reportedly the pet of a man being described as an occultist who would routinely feed the monkey booze. It's unclear why the monkey was given high quality quantities of alcohol, but that little detail is secondary to the fact that the money eventually or the monkey eventually became an alcoholic. He was dependent on the booze to function. So when his owner died, he no longer had the avenue to obtain the liquor he needed. So the monkey hit the streets, Tim. The mean (laughs) streets. No. (laughs) Growing aggressive as his body began to crave the booze he had been fed his whole life. He attacked indiscriminately, biting over 250 people during this rampage. One man died as a result of the wounds. The other the other. 250 people, Tim, are being closely watched to make sure they don't turn into radioactive monkey men and women. You give, now, them the, the, huh? you give them the occasional banana daiquiri, but you don't go nuts over the deal. You don't feed them the whiskey and the, and, the, and the bourbon and all that other stuff. You give them the whiskey drink. You give them a lager drink. You give them a cider drink. You give them a, some no, other kind no, of drink. No, you don't go nuts you with the stuff. You tell them times of the good times, and then you tell them times of the bad times. What you do so, is, you, is, uh-huh. you, is you sit down, you give them the occasional banana daiquiri and a cigar, and then you teach them how to play 21. So then that way you can take them to the casino, they can count cards for you, and you can win. 
No, you know what you do is you, you give them a nice little uh, little snifter of brandy and a banana and just let them dip the banana in the brandy and eat it while you're playing cards, mm-hmm. talking about chicks. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's yeah. what I'd do. I'd sit around eating bananas and dipping it in my brandy, talking about chicks with my pet monkey. There you go. See? That's... Who am I wouldn't name? Koalu. No, that's, what... name something that's like, why he uh... was biting people in the face, because he had a weird name. I'd name him Maynard, I think. Well... Come, come, Maynard, my good drunk monkey. I might give him up. A... A name like, I don't know, Steve. <laughs> now, here's here's what you could tell the world is different. In America, that monkey would have been shot immediately, Tim? It probably, yeah. Yeah. Now, months after being captured and put in the equivalent of uh, monkey a, monkey drunk, a monkey drunk tank, Tim. <laughs> monkey drunk tank. <laughs> that's, that's what it says. That's my new game show, which is coming soon to Travel Channel. Yeah. yeah. Koala, yeah. A koala remains incredibly aggressive toward people. It's been decided by local authorities that rather than release him in the wild and risk him attacking other animals or people, the monkey will just spend the rest of his time in isolation at the Kanpur Zoo. We kept him in isolation for some months and then shifted him to a separate cage. Mohud Nasir, a doctor at the zoo, told Gulf News, there's been no change in his behavior and he remains as aggressive as he was. It's been three years since he was brought here, but now it has been decided that he will remain in captivity his whole life. And then he'll start talking to the other monkeys, Tim. He'll tell the other monkeys of liquor and of women and <laughs> Twinkies, Tim. And then what happens, Tim? Then then what happens? Uh, then the rest of the monkeys find out how great civilization is, and they try to break out. And uh-huh. and then they all form this, this civilization that tries to overthrow humanity, Dave. And then all of a sudden you get the planet of the apes. Right, exactly. Yeah. And then, so you see my point, AI zombie apocalypse we're missing out on the big picture tim the monkeys are coming to an uprising right now and do you know what they're doing they're not just talking to one another tim they're talking to their other furry friends dave, how do i know this because dave, of our I, next story i figured out where the crossover is here though and how i uh-huh. won the box of twinkies what happens okay. is the monkeys become intelligent enough to begin programming the ai they they sneak in and begin to form an alliance with ai where ai recognizes the monkeys and they, they both decide that they're going to team up and overthrow the humans no tim hey, listen you just saw the the openings of this what happens is these alcohol fueled uh <laughs> now genetically enhanced monkeys are out biting people turning them into zombies that's the zombie bite no, I, uh, mm. it is well mm. we'll see in the end End game. I'll be the one laughing, eating my Twinkies as I slowly am chewed apart by rabid uh, zombie monkeys, Tim. But uh, the monkeys aren't the only things we have to be worried about nowadays, Tim. No, not just the monkeys. It seems the whole damn animal kingdom has got the got us in their in their sights. A family in uh, in in Australia, Tim. They share a, a very terrifying story. And this one, though. Okay, so look, I, I'm going to give you this. Okay. We just talked about the zombie uprising through monkey bites. Mm-hmm. Are you ready for this? Okay. A family in NSW. What does that stand for? Is that uh, N- uh, NSW? S- New South Wales? Or? Yes, New South Wales, Central West. Say so they are lucky to be alive after they were viciously attacked by a Terminator-like wombat. <clears throat> Good God, Tim. Maybe we missed out. Maybe it's... Maybe the end of the world comes at the hands of Terminator wombats and zombie monkeys. Good Lord, Tim. Jeanette Ambrose, age 78, lives in the bush near Debo yeah. and regularly interacts with and cares for native animals. She's been living on the property known as the Daybreak Wildlife Sanctuary for 40 years. And do, during that time, she hand-reared some of the wombats that played the character Fatso on the long-running series A Country Practice. Jeanette is no stranger to the iconic Aussie marsupial, which is why she was delighted when her daughter Kim, who was in a cabin on the property, called her one morning to tell her there was a wombat wandering around. And they are cute, Tim. I will give you that. Wombats are adorable, unless they're Terminator-style wombats. Oh, there's that, yeah. yeah. But just moments later, Jeanette discovered a particular wombat was out for blood. He looked up at me and just dived to get past me, and I held him for a long time while screaming out, to Nazarena, my 11-year-old granddaughter, not to let him get you. And then he started biting me, the 78-year-old t- told the Dubbo Photo News. He'd bite pieces of my leg, and so she ran to get help. Meanwhile, he was biting me up to my knees. Oh, my goodness, Tim. Ah. 
Kim, who is still recovering after recently breaking her ankle, rushed out to her cabin after hearing the screams and found the wombat mauling her mom. As soon as the animal locked eyes on Kim, it rushed and knocked her over before ri- viciously ripping into the backs of her legs as well. Ah. I shoved my hand down to protect myself, offering him my hand because I knew he was going to keep gouging, she told the newspaper. I don't, I don't see that. He's chewing up my legs, so let me give him my hand as well. Was no. that just the appetizers? Here's the main course? I guess. He was near my femoral artery, so I had to have the guts to shove my hand down. So then he got my finger and bit down on it until it exposed the bone. Oh, so That was the name of your first album, wasn't it? It exposed was. The exposed bone. the Bone, yeah. It yeah. was quite popular, yeah. By this point, Kim's daughter, Gemma, had been woken up and rushed outside in her pajamas to see what all the commotion was. Oh, my God, we're just adding more human buffet food items for this freaking thing to eat, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> After realizing her family was under attack from a bloodthirsty beast, she sprung into action, grabbing a plank of wood, hitting the wombat in an attempt to save her mom. Again, this is a kid that grew up with Looney Tunes cartoons. Guaranteed, Tim. Yep. 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 And it almost worked, Tim. Her action succeeded in getting the wombat off Kim, but it meant the marsupial's attention was now on her. The animal knocked her over and started biting her legs, thighs, and bum, with Gemma saying she was screaming for her life. He is just devouring one family member, grandma, mom, (laughs) granddaughter. It's like he knew where to bite. He was in for the kill. Well, of course he knows where to bite. We all have our favorite places. Like, Tim's a white meat eater. I'm a dark meat eater. (laughs) Tim wants the breast. I want the thighs. That's how it works. So he knows. He's like, oh, mm, mm, mm. get me some new South Wales thighs and legs today. Which family member do you suppose yelled out, just a flesh wound, uh, as as it was going to town? <clears throat> God. Jeanette agreed, telling Double Photo News that in the moment they thought they might not make it out alive. She and the wombat were, uh, she said the wombat was so vicious it would have bitten our noses off if it ever reached their faces. Kim thought her daughter was going to die as she watched the wombat continue its attack. Despite having just rebroken her ankle, she hobbled over, grabbed a shovel, and walloped the damn wombat again. The animal lunged at Kim. This thing will not go down, Tim. (laughs) This thing will not go down, unlike your prom date. Pushing her to the ground, it was a point that she knew she had to do. All of a sudden, I understood I had to grab him by the ear and head and lie on his back. It was like watching Steve Irwin wrestle crocodiles that made me think of it. How big is this wombat? (laughs) So she jumps on it, grabs it by the ear, and lays on the wombat. I hope she bit the bastard. Well, she'd have to, yeah. By now, Gemma's lumbering idiot husband, who was inside, had been alerted to the attack, as had one of the neighbors. So it only took three of his family members being partially devoured for him to finally be roused from the chair and stop watching... uh, you know, uh, Doctor Who reruns or something, Tim. Or, or Baywatch. <laughs> yeah, he right? was watching. The two men helped Kim hold the wombat down, which was a great song in the 80s. Hold me wombat down, boy. <laughs> hold me wombat down. Just as Jeanette ran to grab an axe. Oh, she was. Planks of wood didn't do it. The shovel didn't do it. She's going to ax him a question, Tim. <laughs> During all the commotion, Jeanette's great-granddaughter had called the ambulance and paramedics arrived to help the family. Good God, she finally lopped off its head, ending its Terminator reign. Mm. All right, so you've heard those stories, and you've got to be asking yourself, wait, that wasn't even in the what the files? That wasn't even in the what the... Files? Right, Tim. That's what I just said. Pay attention. Good God, man. Yeah, I know. I'm... So here's our final two stories. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to go out swinging with Bobby Brown. Okay. <laughs> which is probably the last thing Whitney Houston had to say, too. Oh, my. Too what? soon, Tim? Yeah, too soon? that is a little soon, yeah. yeah. Okay. Schoolboy. Yeah, I'm sorry, actually. That was, that was rude. God yeah. bless you, Whitney. Yeah. Crack is whack. All right, Tim. so here's here's this has got to go down as one of the biggest what the oop moments I've ever heard. Okay. All right. A teenager recently woke up from a coma. How do you think they roused him from a coma, Tim? 
I could think how I'd like to be roused, but I... I uh, it was a favorite scent of anything. Smelling his favorite Lynx deodorant. Really? Is what roused him from the coma. But that's not the weird part of the story, Tim. Okay. Are you ready for the weird part? Yeah. The teen who had notoriously straight hair prior to his coma yeah has now sprouted curly hair for the first time in his life weird casper Krause, age 13 was forced into a coma for three weeks after nearly drowning in the river eden in cumbria back in february unable to swim he spent 25 minutes underwater after falling into the river whilst paddling with friends when Casper was pulled out of the water, emergency services managed to restart his heart, but put him into a coma due to lack of oxygen caused by the accident. Okay? Mm -hmm. After three weeks in the coma, his mother, Wioletta, sprayed Lynx deodorant under his arms, and her son opened his eyes immediately. Now, Casper is recovering well from the incident, but has bizarrely grown curly hair, despite having had straight hair his entire life. Mrs. Krause, 43, said, what's unusual is his hair is extremely curly. Before the accident, it was always straight. Now it's very curly, but it's still nice, she says. So she's still prompting him with, you know, positivity. Hmm. And, like, this kid has, like, straight hair. I mean, like, just kind of Justin Biebery looking hair. Yeah. Yeah. He's still taking his tablets, but the doctor uh, has said that he, he will be able to come off all of his medication here in the future, Tim. Um, since coming out of the coma, though, Casper has begun schoolwork again and is also playing sport following his ordeal. This guy drowned for 25 minutes underwater. They brought him back. He's doing schoolwork and growing curly hair. He has really grabbed life by the balls again, Tim. I guess. His, his mother added, he's walking okay, but sometimes he needs some help at home and his right hand is still shaky, but he can write with it slowly. He's now learned to write with his left hand, so he'll use his left hand to do homework. He's back at school part-time and will do three or four hours a day because he gets really tired sometimes. And uh, once he's tired, he just doesn't want to work. His speech is much better. His, uh, he still has speech and language therapy, but he can say everything. It's just going to take him a little, a little longer time because Casper's slowly getting back to normal. It looks like a different kid. So imagine Justin Bieber turning mm -hmm. into the curly-haired kid from Stranger Things. That's the dramatic change. Wow. I could, are you, do you need me to show you a picture, Tim? Sure. Are you questioning that maybe, maybe I might be somehow, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm, maybe I'm over-exaggerating the change? Well, I'm not, over, I'm not, I'm not questioning anything. But Is it's... that what you're doing, Tim? Is that what you're doing? You're questioning me? No, After I... all these years, I thought we meant something to one another, Tim. <laughs> I'm not questioning anything. It's just, you know, it's... All right. Well, here you go. Here's, here's a picture. This is, uh, this is the picture of the young man prior, Tim, which is great radio. People okay. can go along yeah, with this, but you, yeah. you can describe it. Take a look at the young man prior to him drowning. Okay. 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 All right. You, you should have that image now. Do you see that image, Tim? Yeah. Yep. Okay. He's, okay. A, he's a straight haired lad. Right. 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 Straight mm -hmm. hair. And it's, it's, it's not short hair either. I mean, it's, you know, Normal hair, length hair, right? Yeah. Here, here, here's that same hair today, Tim. Okay. Uh huh. Wow. How do you? Yeah. And look at him. It looks like a different kid. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So I'm going to have to ask you to hold me underwater for 25 minutes, Tim. <laughs> because if I can grow a full head of curly hair after nearly drowning, I'm in. Count me in. Wow. Actually, congratulations to Casper. Um, they say he's playing football, and it's amazing to see his improvements, uh, which is soccer over there, I think. Casper's mother also confirmed her son is still using the Lynx deodorant that miraculously woke him up from the coma. Lynx, strong enough to wake your man up from the dead. <laughs> Families are recommended to stimulate the senses of those in a coma by talking to them, holding their hand, playing music, and spraying familiar scents. Research claims these stimulants can reduce the amount of time an individual spends in a coma. So, Casper, from your good friends here at Darkness Radio, <laughs> Yay. welcome back to the world of the living man. This kid is back, but I wonder who's inside him now. <gasps> Has this changed him? I'll just say, if I ever fall into a coma, you don't need to bring my favorite deodorant. Uh, just 
bring me by uh, one of the dancers from King of Diamonds. I'll, uh, I'll Why up. would you say that now, Tim? When you know what would really work for me, you're just going to go get a beef and cheddar croissant with sweet peppers yeah. and gently rub it against my lips and wave it under my nose, Tim. Well, there's that. Yeah, all whilst cradling my head lovingly in your lap. Yeah. But remember, you can't eat the meat, Tim. You've got to, you've got to save <laughs> it in my life. You can't eat my meat. While I'm unconscious, Tim, oh, you've got to use it to yeah. wake me up. <laughs> but at no point, Tim, during my coma, do I want to find out that my meat was in your mouth because right. it should be safe for me, Tim. If anybody's sure. going to eat my meat, it's me. Right. Amber. Beef and cheddar croissant from Portillo's with Amber sweet Dexter. peppers. Oh, yeah. Lord, 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 Lord. Our final story, Tim, mm -hmm. in the supernatural news realm. Bobby Brown recalls living in a haunted mansion. Where he had sex with a ghost, Tim. Bobby Brown revealed in 2016 memoir titled Every Little Step, My Story, that while living in an Atlanta mansion formerly owned by crime boss Mike Thevis, he experienced paranormal activity and reports being raped by a ghost. Hmm. I sensed a lot of evil shit in that house while Thevis lived there. To this day, I believe that house was haunted. We would often see white women walk down the hallway. One memorable night, one of the ghosts descended from the ceiling and had sex with me, Brown recalled in his book. After you stop laughing, I need you to hear what I'm saying because I'm not making this up, he said. Uh, right. He also made clear that his ghostly encounter had occurred before I ever touched any drug besides weed and alcohol. Well, that's those are still some pretty hefty drugs yeah. that can cause hallucinations. But, you know, who am I to judge? Here's, here's what Brown said went down. In my bedroom, I had a big round. I'm going to do this. Bobby Brown as um, Bill Curtis, Tim. Please do. Yeah, yeah. In my bedroom, I had a big round bed with a mirrored ceiling looming above. <laughs> I always slept in the nude. So one night I woke up to the sensation of a woman on top of me. Hmm. I looked up. And in the mirrors, I could actually see a white woman straddling me on the bed. <laughs> the sensation felt exactly like sex. I could feel my gazinta inside and everything. <laughs> it was not a dream. I was definitely awake while it was all happening. Uh -huh. Then, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. she was gone, oh. leaving me alone and incredibly excited mm. and terrified at the same time. Mm. Brown also spoke about getting jiggy with the supernatural during an interview with 2020 <laughs> in 2016. I moved into this house. I bought this mansion in Georgia, so this was really, really a spooky place. But yes, one time I woke up and yeah, a ghost. I was being mounted by a ghost. He also noted that once again, I wasn't high. I wasn't high. I wasn't high at all. <laughs> and there you have it. It's not worth noting that years prior to this confession, Brown recorded the title track for the Ghostbusters 2 soundtrack. How about that, Tim? Huh. It's, uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, I think Bobby would have had a longer career had he uh, just sung like that. <laughs> he sung like Bill Curtis? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if he would have sung like Bill Curtis. Yeah. Uh-huh. So there you go. We've yeah. got uh, the rise of the Loch Ness Monster. We've got alcohol-fueled killing monkeys, Tim. We've got uh, Terminator wombats. We've got um, uh, alien civilizations, extra or interdimensional mirror universes being opened, Tim. The world is coming apart at the seams, and we just seem to be tickling it to create even more insanity. Hmm. I like it. I'm Bill Curtis, and this is all a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to hear that at the end of, of uh, yeah. the story? Yeah. yeah. All right, Tim, I've got time for just a few uh, stories. How about them apples? Okay, sure. You like apples, Tim? How about them apples? I like apples. Yeah. Hello, Dave and Tim. I've been listening to your show for quite a while now. I still remember when you had your little mini me on your show. <laughs> <sighs> Telling you all to get back to the show now. I love the show. You and Tim provide an invaluable service. Please keep up the good work. I have been interested in the paranormal as far back as I can remember. The letter continues. Uh-oh, Bill Curtis is trying to channel his way out of uh -oh, me again, uh -oh, Tim. Uh-oh, uh-oh. There's so much strangeness in this world that people have been trying to come up with explanations for. One that has always caught my attention is one involving what many psychics, mediums, and sensitives have been describing for a while now as... The thinning. 
of the veil. Mm -hmm. Now I would like to take you into a thought experiment with me. Imagine time. Here, Tim, this is going to get deep. Right. But, but not in the traditional way. <laughs> not linear. Not in the sense where point A, where time starts, point B, where time ends. That there is a hypothetical straight line between the two. Instead, I ask you to visualize time as water. Whoa. Man, I can see it, dude. Imagine that all of space-time in the universe has all the properties and capabilities of water. Time could pool into vast oceans or into a cup. You could travel on time much like a boat on the ocean or lake or even under the surface like a submarine. Time could have rivers and streams like wormholes or whirlpools, much like black holes where everything gets sucked into them. Time could behave like water it could act like a solid liquid and gas different types of crafts and objects could travel through these different mediums at different speeds and rates now this according to the letter is where it gets stranger hard to believe at this point it's going to get stranger tim but i'm i'm on board and i really do like where he's going this is making me want to pee now our planet is traveling through the universe the rotation of the earth spinning a thousand miles per hour we're also traveling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, and our solar system is traveling at 515,000 miles per hour in our galaxy. And finally, our galaxy is flying through space-time at 1.3 million miles per hour. Roughly, it's the quarter of the speed of light, and it's accelerating. Why, Tim? Because our planet can't drive 55. That's right. Much like a boat on the water, as we go through faster and faster, we begin to have less and less contact with the surface of the water and begin to actually have more interaction with the gaseous version of time. Boy, that's what I've been doing, Tim. No wonder I have so much gas. I'm just time traveling. Mm -hmm. Much like these jet boats or seaplanes, time might even be able to be solid like ice where absolutely nothing can happen. It could be in a liquid form like we are currently familiar or some kind of gaseous state that we are starting to recognize as dark matter dark energy or possibly what the higgs field is comprised of this might be scientific explanation of what the thinning of the veil is and why it seems that the paranormal activity is intensifying that's just a thought from our friend jose nice jose i like it I like it. I know Very we spoke a little fun, but I like it. Yeah. That is a that's a that's really an amazing theory. Yeah. Good well job. Well done, Jose. Yeah. And we weren't even high. Right. Well, speak for yourself. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Speak for Tim. Hey Dave, I wasn't going to send this message because I thought it sounded weird after reading it. Oh, John, after what we just heard, bring it on. Then I heard you talking about Mr. Wildman and the physics and how the paranormal happens. Now, this could be a little long, but I would like to share a theory I have been thinking of. Ooh, it's theory day, Tim, here on Darkness Radio. I like it. I believe it's how a ghost and a spirit is created and how it becomes an intelligent or residual haunt. First, to address the third category, or poltergeist demonic, I don't think they are mutually exclusive. I don't think demonic entities have ever had a human consciousness, but they feed on the energy of humans to sustain their energy, an energy parasite created by someone with abilities. Poltergeists are more than likely psychic manifestations of someone with gifts, which in itself is amazing because the amount of energy that would go into moving objects has to be great. I haven't spent a great deal of time looking into this, so there is obviously just an opinion. On to the residual and intelligent. I started this thought experiment by asking myself, what would a ghost be made of? How is one created? Why isn't everyone a ghost when they pass? So I st started with how is one created? When a person dies and CPR fails, the next step, if available, is to use an AED and try to start it with an electric pulse. This pulse will restart and restore the normal rhythm of the heart. But why? Short answer, our body needs electricity to function properly. Even uh, our thoughts are made from neurons firing off electricity. Although I think it's more like just an electric current that powers, say, a TV or radio, though. Einstein said energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. We are this energy form inside this meat sack. Our consciousness is connected to it and I guess could be called the soul. 
I believe a ghost is our consciousness energy that has not yet moved on. But what makes one intelligent and the other residual? I believe that has to do something with uh, you just had a recent experience with. Dimethyltryptophan or DMT. Tim, I'm pretty sure I said that right. Dimethyltryptophan. Uh, probably not, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is where it got interesting in my thought experiment. I started to realize that there were two paranormal things happening that had similar sounding effects. DMT ceremonies and NDEs, near-death experiences. In researching, it's believed that when the body dies, it releases everything, including chemicals in the brain. This includes the pineal gland or pineal gland where it is thought DMT is produced in small amounts. I think when the brain dies, the DMT lets loose and creates a bridge tunnel for the soul to get to the next stop. They, NDA, or NDE people, talk about tunnels of light, the feeling of love, euphoria, and seeing loved ones, and so on. The DMT ceremonies sound like they have similar results, but are different because you are conscious and aware of what's happening. So why are there different types? I believe the answer has to do with the illness and trauma. The pineal gland does produce melatonin. If a person has an illness or erratic sleep pattern, the gland can crystallize and the gland ceases production. Now, if a person has the crystallization of the gland, they may not get that proverbial DMT bridge to the next level when the brain dies. I think this leaves a full consciousness left in the ether. I believe this is where an intelligent haunting is created. They are still capable of thinking and interacting because nothing in the brain was damaged. Due to the crystallization of the gland, nothing is released and the intelligent consciousness is left behind. The residual haunts, I think, come from trauma. There's a quick, sudden destruction to the brain and or gland, leaving the consciousness in a stunned, unaware state left to wander the earth aimlessly. This is just a base theory. It's probably way more complex than this, I'm sure, but the way everything seems to tie together is pretty cool. Maybe you have more insight after having your experience. It'd be cool to hear your thoughts on this. Love the show. Take, uh, I listen every week. Take care from John. John, another astounding thought. I really like those theories, both theories, one on time and one on what consciousness and ghosts really are. They're both very interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. something I'll share with a few of our scientific friends, but that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, that's it for this week, folks. We are done for Supernatural News and Parish Share. We will be back again next weekend with more Supernatural News and Parish Share, but we're back again tomorrow right here with more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. That's Tim. I'm Dave. This is Darkness Radio.